Good evening and welcome. This is a regular meeting of the Princeton Planning Board on March 2nd, 2023. Pursuant to Section 13 of the Open Public Meetings Act, adequate notice of the time and place of this meeting has been given by prominently posting the resolution of regularly scheduled meetings of the Planning Board of Princeton for February 2023 through January 2024. A copy was filed with the Clerk of Princeton on January 17, 2023. Legal notice on the adoption of said resolution was published in the January 13, 2023 edition of the Princeton Packet. Notice of this meeting also has been posted to the municipal website, princetonnj.gov calendar. Pursuant to Executive Order 103, the state of emergency in New Jersey regarding COVID-19 remains in place to ensure that the state continues to have the necessary resources as COVID-19 is managed on an endemic level. Therefore, notice that all regular and special meetings of the Princeton Planning Board will be held electronically via Zoom, was transmitted to the Princeton Packet and the Times, and was filed with the Clerk of Princeton on Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. During hearings on applications for development, members of the public will have an opportunity to comment and ask questions. Questions may be asked after an applicant's witnesses have testified. Public comment is heard by the board. After applicants' representatives have finished their presentations and have been questioned by planning board members and staff. Those wishing to comment orally should virtually raise your hand by clicking on the reactions or raise hand icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or if participating by phone by pressing star nine. Oral comments will be taken in the order in which hands were raised. We ask with respect that members of the public express your views in three minutes or less. We'll have a countdown clock to help speakers keep track of time. Please note that speakers who exceed three minutes will be interrupted. Inappropriate public comment containing obscenity, hate speech, or relating to matters not before the board will be muted. Carrie, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Capazzoli? Mr. Chow? Here. Mr. Cohen? Here. Mr. McGowan? Here. Mr. O'Donnell? Here. Mr. Quinn? Here. Ms. Sachs? Here. Mr. Texarney? Here. Mr. Taylor? Here. Mr. Bodeheimer? Here. Wilson? Thank you. Um, announcements. Um, we can start with Mr. Lesko. Justin, if you're ready. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, for, first, um, I sent out an email earlier today that I received from our open space yeah. manager uh, with a memo about a scoping hearing uh, for a green acres diversion. Um, it sounds like a lot, you know, it sounds very technical, but uh, really what it is, is uh, the building I'm sitting in right now. Uh, it's on a, the same parcel as Community Park um, South. Um, and uh, there, it was designated uh, as a as open space under Green Acres, but the building was built here. Um, you know, 20 years later, uh, the uh, state you know referred to us that this is the case, and our new open space manager has been working on our roster of open space, um, and we're basically going to go through this diversion process to make it right, mm -hmm. um, so that we could use Green Acres funding in the future uh, for open space protection. Um, so that hearing on, uh, I believe it was April 22nd, um, is open to the public, including all of you. Um, and the discussion will be about the diversion. And, and uh, I think it's, uh, we need to replace what is being used for non-open space purposes at a three to one ratio uh, elsewhere in the town. So that, that um, part of the, the scoping hearing requirements is that we transmit it. Uh, the notice of the hearing to the planning board. You'll also see big signs at entrances to the park uh, or really all throughout the parcel that includes community park and this building. Um, it has the same text as the memo in there. And uh, like I said earlier, that'd be April 22nd, I believe 7 p.m., um, but I don't have it directly in front of me. But anyway, uh, you'll see it sent out um, in the email I forwarded earlier. 
7 p.m. Oh, April 3rd, excuse me. April 3rd mm -hmm. at 7 p.m. at this building, which we're also talking about as being part of the diversion. Mm. Okay. Justin, I, I don't know that I got that email. I think sometimes the um, office is still using my old me email from two years ago. Okay, I'll make, sure I'll, yeah, make sure I'll make sure we get I'll make sure we get that over to you. you. And then if there's no, are there any questions on that? Yeah, Apparently just, not. Oh, yeah, I'm I do, sorry. I oh. do actually. Uh, is this something that would come before the planning board? I mean, why why is the planning board being informed of it? Just, just as background. Yeah, part of the requirements um, are those big notice signs are uh, transmitting it to certain boards and the planning board is one of them. Uh, so nothing is being asked of you um, necessarily. Uh, if you did want to go to that hearing, feel free to. Um, but part of the requirement is that it, it we alert the planning board um, that the hearing is occurring. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Basically correcting an old oversight and there are lots of ho hoops to jump through. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, good. Any other questions for Justin about that matter? If not, Justin, if you could give us a master plan work update. Certainly. Uh, so the uh, master plan, as I've mentioned last time and the time before, uh, we're really getting over the hump. Um, you know, we're, we're about more than halfway through the process. Uh, we're now projecting a November adoption before this board. Um, that's based on some of the changes that we've made to have subcommittee work of the, um, the, the overall master plan steering committee. Um, I'm getting sick of saying this, uh, so I know you're probably getting sick of hearing it. Um, but I will have firm dates uh, within the next week as to how we land this plane and, and you know, everything up to that adoption. Um, we're just finalizing a few more things as the consultant meets with staff to do the uh, technical interviews uh, at this time. Um, the consultant's meeting with uh, having seven or eight separate meetings with engineering, sewer engineer, land use engineer, uh, our engineering director. Um, with uh, myself and Mr. Bridger uh, to discuss land use and zoning, um, with the open space manager, uh, Cindy Taylor, um, I'm trying to think what else, with the historic preservation officer, um, and actually outside of the municipal government with the special improvement district uh, director to discuss the economic development element. So those are happening now right. and we'll have further information once we uh, uh, you know, get through those, and I have a call tomorrow with the consultant to discuss finalizing the uh, community visioning survey, the open house that we're going to have, uh, those final planning board hearings, um, the subcommittee meetings, and the uh, overall steering committee meetings uh, as well. So we'll make sure to get those on the website, get them to you. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel just yet. But maybe it's like a little little flicker right now that that we're getting closer to. All right, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Texarni. Oh, um, any word on like uh, further engagement on the website, like uh, expanding engagement features? Yeah, we have a few quotes on different things that can be done. Um, you know, with this switch to subcommittees, we're trying to make sure that you know we're. If we are spending more money, we're doing it for a valid purpose, not just for the last thing I would want would be to have some website where people feel like they're uh, submitting information, but it's not really going anywhere. So we've batted around uh, with the, um, oh, I always forget the name, Louise, can you help me here? The, not the, uh, with you, Al Alvin, Christine. The support team. The support team. Uh, we've batted around these ideas um, and we'll see if maybe we want to do something before the open house, um, a virtual component of the open house, or maybe if it makes sense to slot in something after. The uh, the things that we've tossed around are a virtual open house, um, an ideas wall online using the engagement hub, a map uh, where people can plot things in, um, and you know anything else that might come up. Any other questions for Justin, about master plan work. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, announcements from board members or staff? Uh, I actually have one more about oh. the land. <laughs> yeah. Go um, ahead. Just as you saw on your agenda, um, and this is really for members of the public that might be here too, 
Um, the application for the land wind development uh, is postponed to April 20th. Um, I believe we'll be taking jurisdiction of that tonight, uh, but there will be no hearing. There will be no vote on that. And when we get to that, uh, just for the information uh, for the public, we, we will announce when that's going to be continued to. And April I, I 20, know, right? I'm sorry? <laughs> Didn't Justin just say it's being continued to April 20th? Did you say that, Justin? Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I missed that. All right, all right. Yeah. yeah. Jerry, can we can we just do the jurisdiction now, or, or do we have well, I, to? I talked to Carrie about uh, basically moving it up, um, Landwind, so that it was before the area needed rehabilitation, and just take jurisdiction okay, okay. and formally announce when, when we're carrying it to. Okay, so we'll do that after the resolution. Yeah, I think so. Got it. That's all I Good. have. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay, let's consider the minutes. We have minutes from a regular meeting on September 8th, 2022. Mr. Cohen. Yeah, I had just a minor correction that I sent Carrie very last minute right before the meeting. Uh, it's on page three, the second paragraph where it quotes me as saying the number of walkways was reduced to reduce impervious coverage. It's actually the number of driveways that was reduced. This is, um, so um, with that change, I would move approval of the minutes. Thank you for that. Moved by Mr. Cohen, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Bodigheimer. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, resolution, we have a resolution for Honeybrook Estates, LLC. This was a minor subdivision at 225 Mountain Avenue, block 6704, lot one. File number P2222-286MS. Uh, any, any comments or questions about this resolution? Yeah. I just wanted to um, note one thing. On page four, um, at least the way it printed out for me, at the very top, it says exhibit A1, applicant to confirm. Um, we were never able to get a confirmation of uh, from the applicant that it was a, uh, that A1 was at the subdivision plan. But I think we should just substitute that, take out what's in brackets and put in subdivision plan. Good. Any other comments or questions about this resolution? And if not, would someone like to move it? So moved. Thank with, you, Mr. Quinn. With the okay. clarifications of that Jerry just articulated. Great, thank you. And is there a second? I'll second it. Uh, moved by Mr. Quinn, seconded by Mr. McGowan. Um, Carrie, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Chow? Yes. Mr. McGowan? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Mr. Taylor? Yes. Mr. Bodekheimer? Yes. Ms. Wilson? Yes. Motion carried. So as was mentioned earlier, we're rearranging the agenda to um, <clears throat> take jurisdiction on Lanwin. I am recused. Uh, on this application. So I'm going to stop my video and put myself on mute and cover my ears <laughs> and um, come back when you're done. Um, Miss Sachs. And I should have said, I'm passing the gavel remotely to Mr. Quinn. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go ahead, Councilwoman then. Sachs, you had a question? Yeah, I'm fairly certain that I'm recused as well. Okay. Right. Thank you for acknowledging that. I would advise that you turn off your camera and uh, mute yourself. And as as the chair decided, um, go into a cone of silence. I guess. Um, <laughs> so uh, the matter before us is Landwind Development Modified Plan, Preliminary and Final Major Subdivision and Site Plan. 725 and 8 
23 Herrontown Road and 915 Mount Lucas Road, Block 1001, Lots 1, 2, 14, File Number P1818-64, for eight S P F slash P. Um, the MOUL deadline was 22318 and the extension was to 42823. And we are postponing this hearing until April 20th, 2023. And, and Tim, if I could just announce for the record that proof of Please. publication and service are in order and the board does have jurisdiction. Yeah, by the way, it, it's, I believe the agenda says April 28th, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that's the, um, the extension is often different from the, um, from the meeting date to allow for the processing uh -huh. of paperwork, I Very believe. Good. And I, I'm sure Ms. Phillip, I it's would correct. welcome her to come in and correct me if I'm wrong. Not wrong. Okay, so do we need to vote on this, Jerry, or just- uh, yeah, or... yeah, I think we should. And I think we should announce now officially since we've taken jurisdiction, what it's being carried to. So it's being carried to April 20th, uh, 2023. Okay. Yeah, and then I think we should have, have a vote. Um, just for the record, I'm Kenneth Logier for the firm of Roselli, Griegel, Logier and Lazaro on behalf of Landwind Development Corporation this evening. And I wanna thank the board for taking this out of turn. <clears throat> oh, you're welcome, Councillor. Um, so uh, a motion to uh, postpone till April 20th. Someone, oh. anyone, Mr. O'Donnell and seconded by Mr. Chow. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, so moved. And uh, I'd invite uh, Chair Wilson and Councilwoman Sachs to rejoin us at their earliest convenience. <laughs> Thank you, folks. That was a convenient. nice little slide in there, Louise. <laughs> OK, thanks. Um, Next up, we have a discussion um, about uh, a proposed area in need of rehabilitation. This is um, block 5901, lots one, two, three, and four, and block 6001, lot 14. Um, this is the Textile Research Institute or TRI property. Um, I would note that we have 30 members of the public uh, attending um, and uh, listening in. And I want to let folks know that after um, we hear presentation from planners um, and the board has an opportunity to discuss and ask questions and such, um, we will um, entertain questions and offer an opportunity for comment on this um, with the three minute, the same three minute limit uh, time frame that we impose uh, for all such comments. Okay. And Madam Chair, as you know, I, I don't participate in these, but I've been asked by Justin and Jim Kyle if, if I could cover tonight because uh, Frank Reagan is not available. So unless the board is, uh, would prefer not, I, I'll stay on, on, on the screen. But very much prefer that you stay on. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Muller. <laughs> Um, so let's see, Mr. Lesko, you want to get us started here? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and earlier I didn't say good evening to the board um, and to members of the public, <laughs> good evening. Um, what's before you at this time is a uh, area need of rehabilitation uh, designation referral to the planning board. Um, this type of thing is governed by the state, local redevelopment and housing law. And under that law, uh, the council refers this uh, proposed resolution um, for your recommendations, uh, including any modifications. The resolution that you saw in your packet uh, was prepared by the municipality's redevelopment planner, Jim Kyle of Kyle McManus Associates out of Hopewell. Um, and this is a little different because um, it's not quite a master plan consistency review, or it's not that. Um, 
But as always, I've reviewed the master plan and I'm happy to, to discuss uh, that um, after we hear from Mr. Kyle. Uh, just a little more background, Princeton hasn't declared any areas in need of rehabilitation to date. Um, as you know full well, uh, Princeton's declared areas in need of redevelopment um, and then prepared uh, redevelopment plans, um, including for Heinz Plaza and the buildings around it in 2003. Um, and you probably still remember some of the, uh, the ones for the shopping center not too long ago. Um, I, I do want to note for both the board and the public that the discussion tonight is about the designation uh, of the area in need of rehab, um, not necessarily any structures uh, that will go on the property. Um, this designation is based on uh, a declaration that the site meets one of six criteria in that local redevelopment and housing law um, that uh, Mr. Kyle will get into. Um, a redevelopment plan would need to be put into place uh, following this designation for anything different to happen on the site. Um, and at that point, that would include outreach to the neighbors and ordinance directing creation of the study, um, another hearing at the planning board or the planning board, uh, you know, overseeing the study uh, itself, um, noticing to the neighbors and another ordinance at council to, to put that into place. So that's a much more involved process than the designation itself. Um, so the last thing I should note is that the uh, resolution before you under the local redevelopment and housing law process uh, would need to go back to the council um, to discuss publicly and for the council to make a decision on. Uh, so what we're doing tonight is uh, hearing your comments um, as a board. Uh, I'll then prepare a memo to council with those comments. Um, and then the public hearing would occur at a council meeting. Um, it's not currently scheduled, by, but I anticipate it would be a, a relatively soon one. So with all that being said, um, I will turn to uh, Mr. Kyle uh, to further discuss the area in need of rehab process um, and the criteria he considered um, in the resolution that he prepared. And I could take this question from Alvin uh, before that if it's... If it's yeah, thank you. And uh, also Nat has a question. Go ahead, um, Alvin. Okay. I just want to be clear because you've used rehabilitation and you've used redevelopment so as this process goes this this is for rehabilitation this will be followed at some time later for an application for redevelopment that that that's eventually going to be part of this too mm -hmm. uh yeah that's certainly a possibility and what we expect uh right now it's just the designation and then the whole process would happen with a redevelopment plan so right now it's really just about those six criteria that Mr. Kyle is going to get into. Then later on, it would be about, you know, uh, putting in a, a different process and, and leading to uh, a redevelopment plan. Okay. This might seem like a distinction without a difference. And maybe Mr. Muller was about to say this. Um, but Jerry, you're on mute. Why don't you opine? Yeah. Um... It's a different, you have areas in need of redevelopment, and there are very strict noticing requirements for that. And then you have areas in need of rehabilitation. But a, a lot of the powers that are granted by the governing body, to the governing body are granted not only with the area in need of redevelopment designations, but areas in need of rehab and rehabilitation designations as well. Uh, one of them, but, and there's no notice, it, the standards are much... Uh, less strict in terms of what the criteria where you have to meet at least one of them for areas in need of rehabilitation versus areas in need of redevelopment. Um, and, and there are no noticing requirements for areas in need of um, rehabilitation. It's much looser in that regard. Now, if it's an area in need, uh, if the area is, de is determined to be an area in need of redevelopment, which would go through the process where it starts. And we've done this. It would start with the, the council. They would request the planning board basically to do a study based upon a map they've prepared um, of whether any of the criteria have been satisfied. And then it would go back to council. Um, and that could be a condemnation redevelopment area or a non-condemnation redevelopment area. And it would be deter it would be set forth at the outset, whether it's a condemnation redevelopment area or non-condemnation redevelopment area. But that's areas, not what we're, that's not right, for, what's it, happening here. Right. In fact, that's one of the powers that is not permitted exactly. with rehabilitation that is permitted with a designation of an area in need of redevelopment. 
Exactly. That's where that's where I was going. But yeah. Okay. Okay. And 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 Justin pointed out that if and when the area in need of rehabilitation designation is adopted by council, at that point, presumably work will begin on a redevelopment plan, but it will never, it, that's not to say that it will ever be a site that has been designated as an area in need of redevelopment. It will be a redevelopment plan within the context of an area in need of rehabilitation, <clears throat> correct? But the redevelopment, well, and Jim, jump in, the area in need of redevelopment, the development plan, if one is adopted, functions the same way as it does if it's an area in need of uh, redevelopment. All the, no, all the notice for- um, I didn't mean in terms of stuff. notice. Uh, yeah, well, that, that's process, true. The process is everything. the same at that point. Yeah. And to the yeah. extent a, a redevelopment plan is adopted, it basically supersedes the, the zoning for the area that it applies to. Jim, do you want to elaborate on that a little? Uh, no, that, that's exactly right. So the redevelopment plan is essentially the same, whether it's redevelopment designation or rehabilitation area. It's it's just the difference in the designation process. And then, as you pointed out, Madam Chair, condemnation cannot be used in a rehab area. The other distinct difference is you cannot have a long-term tax exemption in a rehabilitation area, only a short-term five-year tax exemption as an option. It doesn't have to be provided, but it can be. So we have three three hands raised and <laughs> and they might all be saying, why don't you just let people give their presentations and then we'll talk about it. But I don't want to presume. Uh, Mr. Bodingheimer and then Ms. Sachs and then Mr. Quinn. Uh, I, I'm happy to defer to more senior members of the board before I make my comment. Okay, Ms. Sachs. Uh, I, I actually was just going to re reiterate what um, the planner Kyle said, and I'm, if I was on the planning board and had not already had um, direct experience in the distinction between a redevelopment, an area in need of redevelopment designation, and an area in need of rehab designation, I at this point would be utterly confused. So I just <laughs> wanted to, for my colleagues, because I've had probably one misfortune would be the accurate adjective, the misfortune to have had um, some direct exposure, intense exposure to these um, various forms of planning in recent months. I would just say that um, rehab is more traditionally used when there is some sort of contamination on the site um, and uh, redevelopment is used. Uh, it's a much more elaborate process with, as was alluded to, um, the hiring of a planner to do an investigation. It's a much more subjective evaluation. Rehab is you know, often just a memo from the engineering office, either it meets the criteria or it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why a municipality might go to great lengths to uh, do an area in need of redevelopment is uh, for the either the ability to condemn the property or to do a pilot, a long-term tax abatement, neither of which, um, speaking wearing my council cap, is an objective of the council on this particular site. Um, I will just say by way of context, wearing my council hat, that um, the interest of the council uh, on this site is um, to begin to enter into discussions about what could be possible on this site keeping in mind that the end of the current affordable housing round, round three is about to end. And uh, it is in the, the council is very interested in maintaining the ability and the leverage of the community to negotiate uh, objectives that are uh, in the interest of the community and community benefits on this site. Um, so hopefully that provides some clarity going into this but it's already become, unfortunately, confusing. <laughs> well, sorry for the role I'm sure I played in that, but thank you for that, um, Ms. Sachs. Mr. Quinn, and then Mr. Bodekheimer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to go back to something that Justin uh, alluded to in his, uh, in his comments that sort of, to sort of set the, what we're actually sort of talking about. He said, 
were not to talk about any structures. Does that mean structures that are on the site now or anticipated structures that that would result from some plan that we don't know about in the future? Yeah. And then I have a follow up question for that uh, to that. Sure. Yeah. What I meant there was the discussion tonight about the, you know, the designation under those six criteria that Jim will get into. Um, it's not about, you know, uh, what we think might be proposed or, or what we would like or, or anything like that. That will come later uh, when we, you know, look into it in the process that uh, Mr. Mueller uh, described. But specifically to the to the discussion of structures. Um, did you, were you referring to the, so I'm familiar with the site and familiar with the structures uh, on the site as many people in Riverside are, especially younger people who might not be authorized to be on that, uh, on that site. So um, were we to ask a question about one of the existing structures, would that be within the realm? And I just have one other question after that. Yeah, certainly. And you'll see once Mr. Kyle uh, gets into his resolution, um, how those current structures and the current status of the land, uh, you know, are really what this designation would be about. Um, you know, I, I just mean the things for the redevelopment plan that, that could come later, you know. Okay, tonight. great. Great. That's, I think that's helpful for, well, it's helpful for me. I don't know whether it's helpful for, uh, for my colleagues. And I also, that um, it, it's good for, I imagine that there are some neighbors of the site who are among the 37 attendees. And I, just a point of clarification for Councilwoman Sachs, um, you said that the, the current round is about to end. That that end date is 2025, is that correct, or? The end of 2024. Oh, okay, well, thank you, thank you. So the new round starts at the beginning of 2025. So needless to say, for the next year, there will be growing interest in properties in Princeton and um, any that remain in uh, various states of, uh, in various states of whatever they may be. So it is, in the council is very interested in being proactive in um, uh, looking to see what is in the town's interest and not not leaving things to uh, to 2025 when uh, we lose uh, a great deal of leverage in terms of negotiating things that benefit the, the town. But I that's probably again too complicated for this discussion and uh, no i not at all i think it's helpful to know the the time frame and we we don't an, do you anticipate that that'll be a, a court led process the way the former process was well that is certainly something that the whole state is <laughs> eagerly waiting <laughs> to, to know the answer to and i uh, have no insight into Certainly the way it's being set up at this point, yes, it would continue, and unless there's a major change, it would continue to be a, a court-led process. Um, Unfortunately, Mr. Quinn, it looks like that's what we're gonna be stuck with. Well, good luck to all involved. And <laughs> thank you for answering my questions. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Bodingheimer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, uh, as Councilwoman, <laughs> Uh, Sachs alluded to that the, the level of confusion, potential confusion here is extremely high. And I, my question is about trying to simplify so I can understand and follow what it is that we're doing. And I'm also like others going back to Justin Lesko's presentation. Justin, you said that we were not to consider the structures on the site, but we've also been talking about the criteria of a site in need of rehabilitation. I'm sure I'm screwing up the terms. My question to you is what it is that we are commenting on, because as I understand it, and I'm a little confused, so I'd like some help. This is an issue for council to take up and we're advising the council on our opinion of whether this meets the criteria and there are six of them, eight of them, there's some set of criteria. And we're 
telling the council whether this indeed meets the criteria of the area in need of rehabilitation. At Not least that. one, at least one of the criteria. At least one of them. And, and I think Mr. Kyle is probably going to go into considerable detail about. Okay, um, but I'm just trying to figure out what our, what our task is. Our task is to sort out whether it meets any of the criteria and not to be thinking about what is obviously going to be a, a concern near and dear to neighbors, who among whom I count myself, one, is what we'd like to see happen there. That's a different question. Mm -hmm. am, I, yeah. am, I, am I? And I'm not sure that that question could be addressed to Justin or uh, Mr. Kyle or Mr. Mueller, but I'll, I'll go with, with Mr. Lesko. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, in my memo, I quoted the local redevelopment and housing law, and I don't know if that's going to help or, or not, but it says uh, the municipal planning board shall submit its recommendations regarding the proposed resolution including any modifications which it may recommend to the governing body for its consideration. Um, so, so yes, so, so it's like, yes or no, it satisfies the criteria. And if we have anything else to say, we can say that too. Yes, yeah, exactly that. And just to reiterate again about my comment about the structures, obviously once Mr. Kyle starts uh, with you know his presentation, the structures that are currently there are, are certainly within part of the criteria. What I meant by that was, let's not talk about any speculative redevelopment plan tonight. Let's talk about the criteria and the proposal in front of us. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Great. Um, so with that, do we need to swear in Mr. Kyle? I guess we um, I typically don't for a presentation, especially with our own professionals and consultants uh, doing the presenting. Is that correct, Mr. Miller? Yeah, I don't think for this we need to okay. see anybody. Here. Yeah. <clears throat> Welcome, Jim, Kyle. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> it's finally your turn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as has been indicated, uh, our office was retained a special redevelopment planner for the municipality. And we were requested to just take a look at this rehabilitation designation and assist um, with that. So we did help uh, Mr. Regan and Mr. Lesko with the resolution that is before the board that was in your packet this evening. And, you know, we've talked about the differences between a redevelopment designation and a rehabilitation designation a little bit. Um, the main difference is in the criteria that we use. Some of them are somewhat similar in that, you know, if you're looking at structures that are dilapidated, falling down, or, or unsafe. Um, you know, there are some commonalities between the two sets of criteria, but there are a total of six that are included in the local redevelopment and housing law. Those are contained in um, its NJSA 40A colon 12A-14. And I'll just quickly read these and, and probably for the benefit of the public as well, because we only included two of the criteria in the resolution that we thought were applicable and that were met. But there are others. The first is a significant portion of structures therein are in a deteriorated or substandard condition. Um, having been to the property and looked at the, you know, basically the condition of the structures, I didn't note any, you know, physical conditions that were deteriorated or substandard. So we chose not um, to try to apply this criteria. The second one is more than half of the housing stock in the delineated area is at least 50 years old. Obviously, the one structure that's on there is more than 50 years old, uh, but again, it's a single, single structure that's used for non-residential purposes at this point. Three, there's a pattern of vacancy, abandonment, or underutilization of properties in the area. Um, this is one that we did key in on. Four, there's a persistent arrearage of property tax payments on properties in the area. That is not the case here. Uh, five, environmental contamination is discouraging improvements and in investment in properties in the area. Um, as we document in the resolution, and everybody knows, there has been ongoing contamination, which is being remediated, but is not resolved at this point. Um, we did list some of the information that we came across in the NJDEP data. They get very specific about the types of contamination that has occurred on the site. And that documentation sets forth the fact that many of the levels of that contamination far exceed any of the standards. And in fact, this entire area is within 
um, what we call a CEA critical exception area. And there is also a corresponding, well, let me just pull it up, well restriction area. So the DEP data shows a mapped extent of um, known contamination within this rehabilitation area that, that is well documented. And we actually went through the trouble to list some of the contaminants that have been uh, identified in the area. And that classification exception area, well restriction area, just means that there's obviously issues with groundwater and, and there are no wells that are to be drilled in the area um, and that there is contamination that's identified. And finally, the final criteria, six, a majority of the water and sewer infrastructure in the delineated area is at least 50 years old and is in need of repair or substantial maintenance. Um, that was one also that we chose not to focus on for this because we're really, you know, while that may be true for the larger area, I'm not sure what the infrastructure that's on the property physically is, and that was not assessed. So we we chose not to focus on that criteria as well. So the planning board's role, uh, as Mr. Lesko said tonight, the, the scope of this is, is fairly limited. Um, under the rehabilitation designation criteria, the governing body initiates a resolution. That resolution has to be transmitted to this board for review and comment. And essentially, as Mr. Bogheimer says, we're kind of focusing on the criteria themselves. We welcome any additional comments or discussion that the board may have on these criteria. But going on to the resolution, um, there were really two, again, that we focused on, and that was that there was a pattern of vacancy abandonment or underutilization of the delineated area. So this is about 21 acres um, within the area that we've identified. There are a limited number of residential structures. There are two that are on there. Um, and most of these are non-residential buildings used by the Textile Research Institute. There's the, the large mansion that's there. There's also a separate office building that is located. Um, and there's also improvements. But when you look at the aerial photograph that we attached to the end of the resolution, you can kind of see that much of the area is undeveloped. So when we talk about underutilization, um, you know, we're focusing on the fact that much of the property remains undeveloped. There are limited structures on there now. The second one was the environmental contamination is discouraging improvements and in investment in, in the delineated area. As I said, there is this is a known contaminated site listed with the DEP. There are a number of contaminants, volatile organic compounds, uh, lots, lots of which end in ENE, which are not good ones, um, that have been documented on the site. So that that contamination extends for almost all of the rehabilitation area that we've identified. And we feel that it does meet that criterion as well. The, so let me just, uh, Carrie, can I share my screen? Yes, you can. Okay. So what you see is a map that we created. These were the properties that were identified for uh, inclusion in this potential rehabilitation area. As you said, Madam Chair, it's block 5901, lots one, two, three, and four, and then block 6001, lot 14. So looking at this, lot four on the northern side of the rehabilitation area is um, where the remediation activities are occurring. That is a, a standalone structure there. You can see on lot two, um, at the top side of lot two is the office building and kind of in the middle of lot two here is, is the uh, former residential structure that's used for non-residential purposes now. Lot one, there are two residential dwellings that are located on this property. Um, as you can see, this lot has no access or frontage on a public street. There is access to these lots through lot three. However, it doesn't have any frontage on a public street. And then lot 14 is this sliver lot that extends down to Lake Carnegie that's adjacent to lot one. So really focusing on the underutilization, you can see pretty clearly from this aerial photograph that much of the property is underutilized, meaning it's, it's open, undeveloped. Um, so that's why we felt it met that criterion. So the, as I said before, the board's role really tonight is to review the resolution that's proposed. Um, those recommendations, Mr. Lesko will transmit back to the governing body for consideration. And at that point, when the 
the governing body adopts that resolution, they can incorporate the comments um, at, at their pleasure and then you know, finally adopt that resolution and this would be designated an area in, re area in need of rehabilitation. Following that process, as I said before, this is essentially done the same way as a, a redevelopment area in that the redevelopment plan has the same effect um, you know, from a planning and legal perspective that you know, there can be a choice as to whether it supersedes the underlying zoning is an overlay to the underlying zoning. But again, the, the focus tonight is not the end result and what could happen with this property in the future. It's really focusing on the criterion that we've identified and whether or not that is met. Madam Chair, I didn't have anything else. And let me just stop sharing this so we can all see each other. I didn't have anything else in the way of direct presentation. I'm, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions about process and the criteria themselves. So I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions and uh, anything else that the board may need. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. Uh, questions from board members? Uh, Mr. Quinn and then Mr. Taylor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kyle. I, you. Um, you list the all the eans that are in the resolution, and um, you talked about remediation work that's underway. Um, who's conducting the remediation, and and what does that? What's involved with that? I know that neighbors receive notifications from, um, you know, from the a DEP regarding the remediation, but. I think it might be helpful for the board to know. So I'm not aware, Mr. Quinn, of this. All I know is that the remediation is ongoing and the, the issue is groundwater contamination. So, and I believe that this remediation has been going on for quite some time, but as I said, has not been concluded as of yet. Um, I believe TRI is the entity that is undertaking that remediation. Um, so it's it's kind of hard for me to say exactly the details of the remediation and what it would be concluded, but I know it is continuing and is ongoing and will be um, into the near future. Thank you. Mr. Taylor and then Mr. Chow. From my perspective, driving by this area for years, I've often wondered why such a large attractive area has not been developed. While I appreciate the background of the Institute, nonetheless, my question, my focus is what is the relationship between why no development has taken place in such a logical location and the criteria, particularly water and contamination that seems to be at, not at is issue, clearly a criteria that applies. Yeah, so I think, um, well, obviously T TRI has been here for some time. They've been operating on the site for some time. Um, I, I think the contamination, honestly, is a deterrent. And that's primarily why we're, we're looking at the possibility of a rehabilitation designation, you know, to allow potential redevelopment in the future. But my guess is it's twofold. TRI has been on the site operating comfortably, and the, the contamination is just something that you know, would preclude, not preclude, but discourage develop, redevelopment and development. Uh, is that it, Mr. Taylor? That yeah, answer? That's okay. Clear. Thank you. Mr. Chow. I, I just want to understand the criteria of uh, underdevelopment. Uh, is, yeah, some people could argue it's open space and we want to retain it that way. That's it should not be developed. Um, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a little confused by that criteria because. Yeah, so the, the underutilization it, it is really, you know, that it's not meeting its full potential. So if you look at kind of the sprawling development over the site and the limited sprawling development over the site, I think you can look at it and say, you know, even if you think about it in the context of the existing, I believe it's R5 zoning that allows half acre lots, you know, it's it's underutilized in that context, even against the existing zoning. Um, I see. 
as and, and that's a common criteria that's also used in a redevelopment designation as well you know that a, a property is essentially not being utilized to its full potential i would say that's probably under utilization defined so okay. that that's it is, it's, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, so if it was designated open space, we would not call it underutilized because, but because it's zoned R5, it, we have to judge it in terms of the, the way it's been zoned. Well, as that, that and also from a practical perspective, not just against the existing zoning, but if, if you look at the half acre lots and, and you know, 21 um, acres, you know, that that's the potential for 40 some odd single family lots at a half acre. Okay. So, but it's it's really from my perspective when you look at, you know, and Mr. Taylor made the comment, it's kind of this, you know, open, you know, as you see it from from Prospect and Riverside, it, it's kind of open and and less developed, even compared to the surrounding neighborhoods. I mean, when you see on the aerial photograph, essentially everything around this is fully developed. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, to sort of follow up a little bit with that train of thought um, by if the board agrees with the uh, underutilization criterion um, and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I, I personally would not want for the, you know, for that to translate into the assumption that we think the lot should be cleared and covered with houses. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? That I, be, uh, there are there are a number of ways of of utilizing this lot um, in that uh, that would you know be a, a, a high and good use. Um, I mean are we sort of bound to be looking at it? with the against the you know assumption that it would be carved up into half acre lots and and have yeah, that's some, the baseline yeah uh, yeah I agree I think that's I think that's the baseline and Councilwoman Sachs made a really good point before you know obviously we have a lot of community considerations and objectives you know right. open space is a good one so obviously you know, it'd be very desirable to have access to Lake Carnegie in, in some way, provide that resource to the neighborhood um, and with a future, you know, potential development proposal, which we cannot achieve under standard zoning. The redevelop the, the rehabilitation designation and the redevelopment planning process allows affords us a greater measure of control over what the end result is versus just, you know, changing it to a different zone designation or leaving it as the R5. And that is not to assume that it's going to be cleared and covered with houses, because I, I can't imagine that that would be the objective here, but rather take a lot of our, you know, common community interests, fold that into the redevelopment planning process in, in a very public process and come up with something that that works for everyone and meets those objectives. And open spaces is, is a really good one. Um, you know, that through that process, we can do things that we couldn't do under normal zoning, conventional zoning. And I, I, I also don't want to signal, um, not to get ahead, but I don't want to signal that, you know, I personally think that the best use of this property is for it to be vacant, <laughs> for it to be open space. Um, I think that, you know, uh, um, established woodlands, as you see on that site, um, are a, a really important utilization, if you will. Um, and there are areas on that site that are, you know, because of the cleanup that's happening and because of what's already built, you know, good areas for something else um, to happen. But again, I'm, I'm probably, um, you know, going off astray of what our purpose is. So I apologize if I did that. Mr. Bodigheimer and then Mr. Lesko. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think you were you were going in the direction that I was going, which is trying to clarify basically what the choices are before us and you know the question about what's the baseline. The baseline is the R5 zoning and that if the if it were not contaminated and if TRI had been successfully able to sell the property as it had attempted to do over the past decade. It has marketed 
the property, it would be developable by right according to the rules of R5 zoning. And there would be no opportunity for the creation of a public amenity on any of those 20 acres. That, you know, but because it is underutilized and because there is contamination, there is the opportunity for the council to, to make a finding of need of being in need of rehabilitation, putting the property into giving us the opportunity to determine a course forward that does create a public amenity for the surrounding area, the immediate neighbors and the broader community, as well as, as you know, as I understand from uh, from council member Sachs's comments, you know, an ability to think about this as something that's gonna help us contribute to, to meeting our fourth round um, housing obligations. Uh, so, uh, I mean, those are the, seems to me that's the framing. Um, and and I think it's fair to say that the by right zoning that is the baseline is something that would not be of interest to the neighbors. I, I That's a presumption, uh, but, you know, I think, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, it's a crazy one. Um, and I think the opportunity to, 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 to get it in our hands to think about how to create an amenity. I mean, live in the area. Uh, it's a wonderful shoreline. It's a nice place to watch a rowing race from the 1200 meter mark of a 2000 meter race. Sorry to betray a <laughs> an awareness of the rowing. <laughs> awareness is exactly the right word there. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, that, that I was just trying to clarify what and frame what I think the choice is, you know, what 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 the baseline is that we're considering and what, you know, what's before us. Yeah, yeah and I think that's a good characterization. Thank you, Mr. Lesko. Yes, and based on these past two comments, it seems like a good time to mention uh, what the master plan does say about this site, um, and it's actually included under uh, the uh, a recommended uh, area for open space preservation in our open space element. Uh, but not one saying to uh, preserve all 20 something acres. It actually says um, the rear portion of the site provides access to an excellent views of Lake Carnegie, as Mr. Bottingheimer apparently knows. Um, and in any new development on the property, clustering should be recommended in order to obtain a permanent conservation and access easement for a portion of the property. Um, then our historic element uh, actually mentions this uh, under its prior name of Greenlands. Um, as a suggested historic district. I believe uh, it is uh, a, a state uh, designated uh, uh, historic structure. Um, so that being said, when you think about those two things and you think about the R5 uh, zoning, in a way you kind of can't get all three, you know, uh, goals right now or, or under the current zoning. Right. With an area in need uh, of rehabilitation designation, the conversation could happen to make sure all three things happen. I agree. Um, Ms. Sachs, you're on. You're on mute. There you go. I just wanted to um, underscore what Justin said that you know, from the council's perspective, there does seem to be a discrepancy between the existing zoning and what the master plan calls for. And under the existing zoning, which has not happened because of the contamination, um, uh, it has remained uh, undeveloped. I agree with the comments that um, underutilization is, 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 is a very subjective judgment. And um, we, having spent a lot of time in the past few years working to preserve uh, key areas in Princeton, I don't consider them to be underutilized. Um, they're utilized by all the things that uh, are um, we welcome in our in our uh, preserved open space areas. Um, the history of this property is um, it was considered uh, in the previous affordable housing round. I think uh, it was possibly put forward in the initial proposal by the town. Um, can't remember if it made it that far. 
but the issues related to the contamination were, um, um, it was difficult to find, um, from what I understand, a partner who was able to address those issues and deal with um, the, uh, the development as well. Um, I know that there was a movement by various open space groups over time to try to negotiate with TRI to purchase it and 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 to uh, to secure state funding, county funding. Um, there was that never went anywhere um, in in any significant way. I think that the owner of the site was not open to that in the sense of the the, the price that they put was was out of reach. Um, and so that you know leaves us, um, I would say, on the council side with what we're often faced with, which are many less than ideal choices and having to work within the realm of reality. Um, and as I alluded to, um, the, the next housing round is coming up. So um, it, it is, I would say a top priority for the current council to, as per the master plan, secure permanent community access to the lake um, and a recreational easement. Um, uh, and also to, um, I think we think that this site uh, is worthy of um, development, but it is not a, a smart growth site. It's it's not a couldn't fall under a transit oriented development. So I think it's not a site that we would want to see a very high level of density on, um, and. So that is all of those factors. Um, we also, if it were developed under the existing zoning, the if the entire site would be privatized. So not only the current neighbors who use it illicitly, <laughs> but the rest of the community would, would not be able to use it as well. And we would lose what I think is our last remaining opportunity for the community, as opposed to the university to have our own um, lakefront access. So um, those are all of the things that add up to wanting to have the ability to enter into conversations to ensure that the town um, can develop this site in accordance with the master plan. Um, and uh, this designation allows that discussion and those processes to begin. And that's what this is about. And it's not really, I mean, this actual hearing in most towns is five minutes, but of course, because this is Princeton, it's not five minutes. And we're, you know, also uh, diverging into discussions about the meaning of life. But um, as it relates <laughs> to this property, um, I just wanted to to say that the, these are the, the overall overarching priorities for the council um, as it relates to the future of this site. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, looking at its location, um, I was struck, you're right, it's not, you know, right next to transit, but it's very easy bike ride, assuming the street is a, is a bike friendly, <laughs> bike ped friendly street, it's very accessible to, to the university and downtown, you know, straight shot down prospect. And it's also very walkable to um, commercial center you know, at North Harrison and or at Harrison Street and Nassau Street. So it it's a it's a really interesting uh, location with, I think, well, I'll be very interested to see what what happens next. A <laughs> um, lot of a lot of different possibilities. Um, so any I'm not seeing any other hands up from board members with questions or comments. Mr. Muller, did you want to say something? I saw you lean forward. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question. There was a rumor uh, several years ago that the uh, township uh, or, or that the municipality had acquired um, an easement for a walking path through the site. Is there any truth to that? Jim, Mia, anybody? anybody? Uh, yeah, Dustin. What you might be talking about, there's a private Green Acres um, agreement that I've spoken with because uh, you go out there and you go in the driveway, you see a big sign that has a green acres tree, which I think is actually hmm. the Mercer Oak. Um, I've spoken with our open space manager about that. That's really a, uh, it's not green acres or open space 
preservation the way we think about it. It's something that could be repealed at any time. It's just for uh, uh, tax benefits, really, in exchange for some public access. Um, but having gone out to the site, it must have been a year ago now, uh, there were a lot of do not enter signs over by the building. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so maybe that's what you're thinking of, um, but there's nothing for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I had the impression that th there was a path along the northern edge of the site right next to the that residential use next to it. Uh, but it's so overgrown at this point that you couldn't po po possibly use it. Okay. And I don't um, have an answer for you, Jerry, other than that um, you mentioned rumors and I just try to steer clear of rumors in general. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I just shrank back in my chair. Um, okay, if there are no other questions from board members right now, I will invite members of the public um, who would like to uh, weigh in to please raise your hand. I see Mr. Scott McCleary already has his hand up. Anyone else who has comments um, that they wanna share with the board, we'll put on a three minute timer. So it'll be easy for you to keep track of, of how much time you have left. Um, I see Mr. David Graham next and then um, Initial P, Suozo, and then Mara Isaacs. So uh, let's get started. And, and because this is not a hearing, Mr. McCleary, we won't um, swear you in, um, but if you could state your name um, for the record, uh, that would be helpful and then you can go ahead. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Scott McCleary and I'm general counsel to TRI. Uh, TRI owns the vast majority of the property. That's the subject of your resolution. And I'm attending this meeting with Dr. David Graham, who is the president of the Institute and is able to answer absolutely every question that was uh, asked tonight. But and anyway, at this point, I'm not speaking either for or against the designation. I haven't even seen Mr. Kyle's report. So we have nothing to go on other than Mr. Van Heise's summary. Um, I simply wanna make some points of clarification um, which I discussed yesterday with Ms. Mr. Lesko and also uh, Mr. Van Heys in, in separate conversations, uh, and which I think would benefit the board as a whole, especially given the questions that I just heard. So Mr. Kyle spoke about underutilization, and Mr. Chow brought that up in a, you know, a, a, a very significant way. So the notion that the property is underutilized. So I realize that there is a legal definition that we may fit into, uh, and again, Mr. Van Eyes and I spoke a little bit about that yesterday, but again, as a, as a point of clarification, I would not want anyone on this board to think that this property is underutilized, at least not in the common sense of the word, because it, it simply is not. Uh, TRI operates a fully functional research laboratory. It's currently running at full capacity. It's been doing that for decades. It has contracts all over the world. It's highly successful. And so the property is being utilized that way. It's also being utilized exactly as intended. Uh, Princeton, everybody knows Princeton is beautiful, but this is among the most beautiful properties in all of Princeton. The, the TRI property is approximately 18 acres, and nearly all of it is currently dedicated as open space under the Green Acres program. So at least for now, it's effectively a public park. It's incredibly well-maintained, and nothing about it is in need uh, of re rehabilitation, at least not in the common sense of that word, maybe in the statutory sense, but not the common sense. Um, and also the reference to contamination in, uh, in the summary, it, it's a little troubling because I just wanna assure everyone here that the contamination was identified long, long ago. It, it consisted of only 20 liters of solvents that leached out of a metal drum and into the, the ground. It is the subject of DEP oversight, it's all, available public information. We're in compliance uh, and there are vast amounts of available insurance proceeds to cover the cost of the remaining cleanup. So there should not be any worry there. Uh, and also with regard to the contamination, the, the property hasn't remained uh, so-called un, unutilized or, or undeveloped due to the contamination. It, it's in the state it is because that's what TRI has chosen to do. The property is very marketable, um, but again, I don't really want to get into that because this is not a statement for or against this designation. We're hoping that this will be a positive for all concerned, uh, including TRI. We just want you to have accurate facts. 
that, that's basically it. So okay. thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Mr. McCleary, that was helpful. Um, I've been attempting to promote Mr. Graham and it's not working. Hmm. Nope, there well, you go. it just worked. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. Yeah. Mr. Graham, David Graham, if you could activate your camera and unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. Great. Thank you. And this is the Brit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. Go right ahead. Good evening, Madam Chairman, and thank you for hearing me. Um, I'd like to follow Mr. McCleary's comments and with clarification. The site is under Green Acre control, and majority of that site is under the Green Acre. There is a pathway which is well trodden and well used by many of the public down to that lakefront. We have cleared the lakefront, and in fact, many of the children use it as a skiing when the snow is there, down to watch the yachts and probably canoodling by the lake, which is uh, quite accurate for many of the youngsters of today. As the presidents, we spent last year $105,000 manicuring the trees and manicuring the lawn. We have a, um, a gardener that comes in, maintains the grass, we let new trees grow, we attend to the trees that need it, and we cut down the trees as they're overlaying down neighbors. We care for the neighbors as much as we care for the trees. It's sad that TRI had nothing to do with this appraisal. I'm really sad to hear that all these road comments have been made, which is rather sad. I think if we'd been involved, we could have given you more of the facts. The pollutants is only a very small area. It's in a rock. The rock is shale. You cannot get the solvents out of the shale. So the fact that we're saying the site is contaminated, please bear in mind, committee, it's only a very small area of that site that is contaminated. The water is being collected, pumped back into a treatment area, and the water going into Lake Carnegie is clean. You can drink it. I have drunk it. It's as good as drinking water. It's much cleaner than Lake Carnegie water, which indeed is actually contaminated. So when we're making these comments, Mr. Kyle, I'd like you to make the comments honestly, correctly, and with knowledge. I'm really proud of the site. I'm proud that the neighbors use it. I see them walking the dogs, playing with the children, riding their cycles, and may it long last in that format. Madam Chairman, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, next, Carrie. Trying. I don't know why there's so much difference. I think Carrie is trying to bring over P. Suozo, and then the next person with their hand up is Melanie. Melanie. But I, I can't. Uh, when we click uh, promote to panelists, uh, the other person has to accept it too. So sometimes if it's ah, okay. a, uh, or anything like that, but it, it looks tip. like maybe uh, Suozo <laughs> yes. okay. has come over. Yeah. Yeah. Been moved over. Uh, thank you, Mr. Suozo. I hope I'm not mangling your name. If you could unmute yourself and um, just state your name and offer up your comments. Good evening. Thanks. I didn't realize I was uh, I was up. So once I heard your comments, I knew to start fishing around for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you all. Uh, I am glad the first uh, two people cleared up some things I was going to mention. We lived nearby for the past 10 years. Um, and I wanted to say the path does exist. My kids have used it, we've used it. I sometimes go for a walk down to the lake on the path. There's a sign at the entrance to the path. It's, or there used to be, it's right near when you first enter the, the driveway on the left side. And it does run along the north edge of the property, along the road, and then it winds around uh, down the bottom. So, and, and it's a nice 
place with some woods for kids to play uh, in a natural environment. Um, I uh, uh, was glad to hear the second comments about the remediation and the concerns about that. I've never known much on the details of that, but uh, I thought if something is under remediation, then it it wouldn't qualify as contaminated because remediation should mean that you're addressing it. Um, so I wasn't sure how that would be a qual one of the qualifying points if it's already being addressed. So uh, that was just a question I had uh, for for uh, pe the people that know about this. I don't pretend to. Um, and uh, also, I, I didn't think it was a, created a distress on the property. As I understand, there were uh, numerous offers on the property and, and there still are people interested in the property. So I didn't know that it was creating any uh, challenge for it. That's all I have. Thanks for all of your efforts on this. Thank you. Uh, my understanding, um, and anybody who knows better should correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that if a property is you know, known to have been contaminated, it stays that way until it is completely remediated and receives from the DE, the Department of Environmental Protection a no further action letter. Uh, and so while the remediation is ongoing, the site is considered, um, uh, the contamination is considered ongoing, even though the cleanup is actively happening. It, uh, assuming that it is, I, I, I have no reason to suspect that anybody who has said so uh, is wrong. But I don't know if there's a plan on the length of time of it or not that it would factor out that way. A site can still be contaminated even after no further action because um, contamination can be contained as well. Uh, as, ah, okay. You know, it can be removed from the site, but it can also be contained. Yeah, good distinction. Thanks, Zenon. Okay, thank you, Mr. So, Suozo. Is that how you, am I pronouncing your name properly for, for future reference? <laughs> very good, yeah, that, that's lots of proper Italian pronunciation. I know Suozo, but uh, it's become Suozo. That was great, well, okay. well better, way better than most do. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so- um, I did move mm -hmm. Melanie over, and then we also have Ms. Sachs has her hand up. Okay. Um, Hello, I'm here. Hello. So I, I came to this meeting with a totally open mind. Just excuse me, excuse me, Melanie. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can you tell us your last name, please? Stein. My name is Melanie Stein, and I okay. live on Prospect Avenue, close to the property. And okay. I joined the meeting, as I said, with an open mind, just simply to understand what was happening there. Um, and as I was listening to the presentation, I must say that I was disturbed by these comments as if the neighbors were you know, trespassing on the property. Um, it sounded like people have the idea that children are just playing unauthorized. And so, um, you know, it, it is very attractive, the idea of public access down to the lake, um, uh, you know, open space for the community. Um, but, I, you know, I, I would be interested if this were to be designated, for it to be designated with the condition that it would be developed in accordance with the master plan with open space and access um, and substantial open space and access. But, but, but more to my direct concern, it, it is troubling to me as a resident of our community to hear the general counsel of the Institute um, that has spent decades on that property that you did not receive a copy of the report and couldn't comment on its specifics and also the misstatements um, that were made about access and public access and green acres and how is it that a report was prepared and presented to the planning committee that had those um, holes in it and those gaps and um, I really do think that the council and the planning board should be asking themselves that because of all of this discussion, it is extremely troublesome. And that's that I was shocked to hear it. And, and it's and, and, and I think it should be looked into. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stein. Um, so. I would like for someone to address the question that she raised. Is it typical to um, 
you know, prepare a report such as has been prepared here um, and, a, and a resolution recommendation um, without sharing with the property owner? Is there a sort of standard operating procedure? It is, is it the kind of affront that um, it's being taken as, I guess I'm asking? Uh, well, I'll let Jim answer that, but before we get to that, I mean, I really don't want to get into like a, a an arguing uh, match. Uh, nor do I. But, yeah. But I just do want to be clear that this was first brought to council on February 13th, posted publicly. Then uh, was posted publicly, uh, you know, for the last seven days, uh, eight days here. Um, so this has been out there, um, including Mr. Van Heys's memo from from earlier in February, my memo from last week. Um, so I know that probably doesn't directly answer your question or, or uh, answer the concerns from uh, Mr. McCleary and Mr. Graham, uh, but you know this this wasn't necessarily a fly by night operation as it seems to be described as. Yeah, and yeah, also, certainly, Madam, certainly not. Go ahead, Mr. Kyle. Yeah, Madam Chair, just to be clear, that there was no um, report prepared like we would typically do for a redevelopment investigation. The report is essentially the resolution, and, and as I said uh, earlier. You know, this is a much simpler process than a redevelopment designation. And mm -hmm. under the statute, really what the governing body is doing is just setting forth the recommendations or rather the, the criteria that are met in the resolution. And that's what circulated. So there, there was no mm -hmm. separate report that our office prepared that would have been circulated. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I. I use that word. Oh, no, that's was, OK. I, I just no, but clarify. it was misleading and I appreciate the clarification. Uh, Ms. Sachs, and then I saw Mr. Cohen's hand up too, but now it's down. So I was just going to make the same point that Mr. Kyle just made. Okay. About Great. the resolution being the report. Great. Thank you. Mia? Yeah, I wanted to say, unfortunately, uh, and I had suggested that we not move forward tonight because we don't have our regular, um, you know, redevelopment rehab attorney. And those comments that were just made were not made under oath. Um, I just want to note for the record that the comments from TRI, the TRI representatives were not made under oath. Um, it might be, I'm not sure if it's worth having them come back and make statements under oath, but just uh, what appears to, uh, just so um, people understand, there is a contract purchaser on the site that has um, an extensive agreement with TRI um, and um, has already given a, a, there's you know a significant amount of money uh, has already been given to TRI. Um, the town's interest is, as I mentioned, um, is in uh, making sure that the development of the site conforms to what Justin described as the master plan's um, highest and best use of the site. We now appear. It appears that our planning board hearing on what was going to be a small matter has been uh, taken over by a dispute between two business entities over a site. I'm very uncomfortable. Um, I, I'm really not sure how to proceed. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm really not sure how to proceed because I think we're in the middle between uh, two entities who have their own interests in the site and we'll need to work out um, whatever it is that they need to work out. Um, I guess, you know, Jerry and Justin and and um, Jim can, um, you know, let us know what how tonight, whether the planning board should move forward, what 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 action tonight best protects the interests of the town. Jim, do you want to come? No, go ahead, Jerry, if you if you want to weigh in. Well, what's the time frame for getting back to? Is there a time frame, Justin, for getting back to council? Uh, yes, yeah, forty-five days from that. Uh, the referral on the thirteenth uh, should be roughly what um, the end of uh, March, mm -hmm. the beginning of April. The count. Uh, the planning board has to submit their comments, or the council could go through with it without those comments. That's basically the deadline here. Although it doesn't sound like that would happen, but 
just so you know, uh, that that's the planning board's time frame. Yeah. I mean, it would, it would time that on April 9th. April 9th. Okay. I mean, there's a range of options I think we have. I guess one of them could be, and me, I don't know if this is where you're going, maybe it's the opposite direction, is just to um, get back to council with a report that says, we think it's premature at this point, given the entities involved in the possible purchase of, uh, of TRI uh, to resolve whatever differences they have be before uh, the municipality proceeds. I, I would be fine with that or or tabling the hearing. Um, sorry, tabling the hearing and rescheduling. Um, I, I, well, I want to hear um, what Mr. Cohen has to say. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Mr. McCleary. Uh, started out his comment by saying he doesn't necessarily oppose the designation as an area in need of rehabilitation. And um, I don't know if Mr. Graham wants to weigh in on that as well, but, you know, I haven't heard anyone tonight actually oppose the designation. And so I don't know why it would be a problem to proceed, um, you know, with a report that sort of says, the board understands the value of, you know, having an area in need of rehabilitation, and it seems to meet the criteria. Uh, I also wanted to point out that, you know, I think that there is some lack of clarity about the Green Acres arrangement, uh, such that both neighbors and the folks from TRI, uh, you know, are representing that this is preserved open space with public access, uh, what we heard before, and, and I know that I've heard this as well, uh, I think we heard it from Justin, is that the arrangement is a private arrangement between TRI and Green Acres. The, town sh the, the municipality has no role in that relationship, and it's a temporary relationship to, um, give TRI some tax relief. Uh, it's, so it's, not, it's nothing that really protects the access uh, to the site or to the lake, which the community uh, has an interest in and which council has an interest in as well. So I wanted to make those two points um, just because I feel like part of the upset has to do with misunderstandings of the the positions on the two sides, you know, misunderstanding of what that Green Acres arrangement is. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and I'm glad you laid it out that way, uh, David. I, I do think it's important to, to um, clarify that and perhaps even um, amend the resolution to um, reference it somehow and and make sure that it's um you know clear in there in, in some way because otherwise it i mean i i i'm unaware of that kind of arrangement that kind of temporary i mean i i know about temporary conservation easements but i did not know that um that green acres <laughs> issued them <laughs> um so that's that's sort of a new thing for me, but I too have not, uh, I, I think the sort of straightforward question of whether it meets the criteria, um, I, I mean, I, I'm comfortable that it does, but at the same time, even if this board um, says so uh, as a body, that does not obligate council to adopt the resolution. They can continue to, you know, work with the parties, et cetera. Um, but I, I don't think that we should not act um, uh, because of misunderstandings. Um, but I do think that those misunderstandings, if at all possible, should be um, ironed out at the council level and between the parties. 
Um, so I'm sorry, there are now several more hands up. Um, Mr. Both Graham's Mr. Graham and Mr. McCleary okay. already spoke, but they were right. in TRI. So I didn't know if you wanted me to. I, I'd, I'd rather you bring over uh, Mara Isaacs and Beth Lehman. Lehman. And I, I think that we should start swearing people in, Jerry. Well, I, I don't know about swear, swearing some people and not others. I mean, I, I don't know how to unring that bell. I, yeah, this is a, this is not a formal hearing, which is the reason I said I didn't think they needed to be sworn in. But I don't think going halfway through or more and then swearing people in where the prior people were not sworn in is a good is a good way to go. Well, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I know. I know. Yeah. No, I'm just concerned because you know we are. I I I think members of the public is one thing, but I see that the the property owners are you know gearing up to speak again. And I am just, you know, this is un, this is uncharted territory and whatever needs to be resolved is, you know, in terms of this hearing, um, you know, is I'm not sure that we're going to resolve it. And I, I don't know that we should continue to have discussions that to have the property owners since there's just the property owner is here, the contract purchaser is not here. Um, I'm very uncomfortable with where we're going. I I mean, yeah, I think we're putting the board in a vulnerable position. Well, let's hear from the um, members of the public and then perhaps we'll leave it to the um, property owners to communicate directly with um, the town. What would you suggest Mia and David? I, I agree that I don't want to continue the, uh, you I, know, to what I seems like an adversarial David. legal um, process when when it's beyond what we are, you know, we're we're looking at two criteria. So, and I and I think it's very appropriate for the owners to appear at council when this resolution comes up again. I mean. And and certainly happy to have conversations with them prior to that as well. Great. Yeah, and if I could just note, um, Mr. McCleary's hand is still up. I mean, he is an attorney, so I think that probably leaves some level of, of honesty required um, in, in a public setting like this. Um, so if you <laughs> yeah, I know everyone laughs, but typically sure. we um, ironically never swear in attorneys. <laughs> yeah, I think the assumption is there that that he is going to be honest. So I, I do thought think I was muted. <laughs> if he does want to speak again, I think that might, you know, the, the concerns might not be there for him. OK, Ms. Isaacs, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm actually um, here just to bring a little bit of neighborhood perspective to the conversation. Um, and historical perspective to the conversation. I've been a resident. Uh, I'm two properties over from TRI um, since 1999. Um, I am an original founder of the Riverside Neighborhood Association, which if that means nothing to you, it also means you don't remember 20 years ago when an issue with TRI came up before the planning board um, uh, in an even more contentious manner, perhaps, than what we are experiencing this evening. Um, I'll suffice it to say, I'm also speaking as a parent who taught my child how to ride her bike on TRI. That child is now in college. Um, so I just thought it would be useful to say to all of you, there's a lot of history here. And there are a lot of people in the neighborhood who are engaged and involved who have a lot of information. And what I am, am feeling from watching this conversation is that there's a lack of information that may be informing some of this conversation. And in two, the two minutes I have left, it's probably, and I don't have all the facts exactly at my fingertips, but I would just like to say um, that I hope that a little bit more due diligence can happen perhaps before any major decisions are made. I support the earlier conversation regarding what constitutes underutilized or not. Um, this is in fact a very well utilized property by the neighborhood. I will say that the neighbor's relationships with TRI has been up and down over the years. Sometimes it's been very cordial, sometimes less so. Um, and that's certainly something that could use some further teasing. Um, 
but to the question of why this hasn't been developed, it's because of what happened 20 years ago. Robert Hillier had a development plan that he put before the planning board that involved um, a proposal for clustered housing and a, a designation of some open space for the community. And it was in that process that the neighbors around TRI made it known that they had observed some improper disposal practices, which then led to an environmental study, which then led to the discovery of the contamination. So the neighbors have a vested interest in whatever the outcome is. And that is all I have to say. And I thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Beth, Beth Lehman is being moved over. Great, thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Beth Lehman. I live at 31 Evergreen Circle. Um, so somewhat across from, I forget what the section was, the lot, maybe one or two. Um, I My only comment is, well, first to reiterate what uh, Mara said. Um, and second to say that I think like regardless of what happens with the space, we have a civic responsibility to make sure that the space is safe. If it's being, if there's an agreement between Green Acres and TRI and it's a private consider it's a private agreement at the same time, if it is a contaminated space and we're allowing the public onto this space, that's a concern of mine that there's not a lot of knowledge about the issues that involve that space. So at the end of the day, I think it's more thinking about the civic responsibility of that space and how we inform the public and, and in terms of, and what actually is happening with the contamination and the rehabil rehabilitation of it. So I love that we have the ability to go to that space um, but as I think somebody mentioned, there's a little bit of confusion as to whether the public can still access that space or not. Um, there's been a few people that have been turned away and, and told that this is a private space. So at, at the end of the day, I just think from a civic responsibility, like we need to make sure um, the contamination and all those issues are very clear to the public that use that space. So thank you. Thank you. Um, are there other members yes. of the public? Mr. McCleary, I'll be moving. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. McCleary, you know, since you're an attorney and representing the landowner, um, I feel like we're going to give you a little bit of leeway. Typically, we would not invite someone to exceed three minutes. <laughs> um, and I just want to reiterate that we, we would, regardless of what happens uh, tonight, what action this board does or doesn't take, we encourage you to reach out um, directly to uh, the town uh, with uh, questions. The matter that we're looking at is is uh, relatively narrow compared with your broader interests. Um, so with that, um, I will let you speak. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, this is for the entire board, but mostly for the concerns of, of Ms. Sachs. Um, there is no dispute between uh, TRI and IPPE. Um, this is not in, in any way adversarial, um, but to explain, um, this discussion has simply been a matter of surprise to us because rightly or wrongly, we didn't know about it uh, until Monday because we were left out of the conversation. I would have liked to have been part of the conversations that led to this. Maybe I'm not entitled, but I think it kind of would have made sense. Um, so that's really what was driving our comments. Um, it's just a lack of information that I'm sure I'll get from IPPE because we have a good relationship with them. 
uh, and from Princeton, which I, I started a nice relationship with Mr. Lesko yesterday when he heard these comments. Uh, I'm confident that we'll go forward and get the information that we need. We just don't have it now. So we're left not knowing what to think other than what we've just learned here. And, and that is the basis for our appearance and our comments. Um, but as Mr. Cohen pointed out, you know, there, there has been no opposition. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. For clarifying that. Um, uh, Mia Sachs, and then we have one more member of the public um, whose hand was up, who I think um, Carrie has brought over, but go ahead, Mia. Uh, that That's fine. I, I, I didn't realize there was an, another member of the public. I, I would be, you know, I, well, I'll, I'll just go ahead. I, I wanted to say, you know, um, that what Mr. McCleary is saying is not what has been represented to us by our attorneys. Um, I um, am not sure, I, I uh, given the history of PRI on the site and their sudden appearance here and um, what has happened with the board tonight, um, I am not sure, I, I, you know, and given that they're, um, this is not a, was, was not the context in which this was supposed to be discussed. I don't feel comfortable moving forward. I will not vote to support this resolution. Um, I just want to make that clear because I there seems to be a much larger dispute taking place here between two parties. Um, and um, I'm not, I just want to make clear that um, the town has a vested interest in the highest and best use of this property. But at this point, it's really unclear what's going on um, between the owner of the property and the contract purchaser. And I think that the best action for the planning board tonight is no action. I think we should um, table the hearing and, um, uh, you know, and, and to the point about the neighbors that they have a lot of information. I think the council will be very interested in hearing from the neighbors all the information that they have about the history of TRI's site on the site. Um, and I think, you know, the, the purpose of moving forward tonight was to begin the discussion with um, the neighborhood and with, you know, this is private property. So there's a limit to the extent to which we as a town can influence the process. There is already and has been for several years um, a contract purchaser on this site, um, and um, you know the the town is now as as I said as we get closer to 2025 interested in uh, you know being more involved to make sure that the interests of the town are represented and the neighbors, but it's no longer clear to me that um, you know that that we are operating with with uh, trustworthy partners. So um, I, I, I can't, you know, I just can't in good conscience encourage us to continue with the proceedings tonight because I, I do very much worry that we're putting the planning board in some sort of jeopardy, so. Okay, thank you for that. Mr. Bodekheimer, Mr. Quinn, Mr. Yeah, Lesko. I, I just wanted to say that I think that the TRI representative's testimony has also uh, thrown me. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just perplexed by what I'm hearing, um, and I, I'm just say that if we have the the amount of time that it sounds like we have in order to get a response back to 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 council, and if, as it also sounds from our council, that even if we don't provide an opinion, that council could still act. I mean, I feel like we should. Uh, we should we should wait to get. If this depends on a finding of facts, and we should feel comfortable with the facts that are before us, if we're going to render an opinion on them about their consistency with the criteria, um, that's that's what my tummy is telling me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Yes, I acknowledging that what we heard tonight was not testimony um i'm i was actually fairly clear coming into this and now i'm uh i'm somewhat confused uh, i mean we have the the sort of open to interpretation 
criteria of underutilization, which clearly is, uh, you know, for open space advocates, it's not an underutilized uh, process. We also heard that the contamination was widespread and the owner disputed that characterization of and said that it was concentrated a, in one space. So uh, I, you know, and and if and Councilwoman Sachs is reluctant to allow a vote on this. And I can't say that I'm <laughs> that I'm totally comfortable based on on what I've heard um, from everyone. Uh, so and I'd also urge us to hear from the remaining member of the public who's had their hand up and has been waiting patiently while we've been having our discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, Justin Lesko, and then um, bring over uh, Silvana. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank Clark. you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, just, uh, I think it's germane to add to this conversation or to reiterate. Um, so under the area in need of rehabilitation process, the only timeline is the 45 days from when council refers uh, the proposed resolution to when the planning board either has to have comments or not. So to table it, um, by my count, uh, March 29th is the, the final day that you would have comments or else it would just default to, there are no planning board comments. So you certainly could table this to the 16th if you wanna continue the conversation then. Um, but statutorily, if you don't provide any comments by the 29th, the, the council could go forward or, or you could not have your say. Not saying that's what's gonna happen, but you know, I would advise that any sort of comments you have, uh, you get in a letter either today or the 16th. Um, and, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong or Jerry, but you don't need to have a recommendation um, of endorsement or, or of non-endorsement, um, similar to like a master plan consistency review. That's not the case. The comments could be, um, so far what I've heard, clarify the Green Acres Agreement. Um, and then, you know, it, it very well could be something like, the, uh, the council should not take action on this or, or see that resolution until uh, they get assurances that um, these parties have figured out whatever they need to figure out. Um, I just wouldn't want that that 45 day timeline to pass. Planning board doesn't get any comments in, but then something still could happen. So, I mean, I, I think that's when we talk about tabling in this context, uh, you know, if we don't get the comments in, then there is a possibility or, or or, or you know, the 45 days is up, you you don't necessarily get a say at those comments. Um, so just to kind of, if that makes anyone feel better about what your task is tonight or or which way, you know, what kind of options you have uh, tonight or on the 16th. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lesko. Mr. Chow? No, uh, let's um, Ms. Clark speak. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I, I thank you for this opportunity. Um, I actually was born um, on Prospect Avenue across from this property. My parents bought the house in the mid 50s. Uh, as a child, I played soccer on the fields and I roamed the, the uh, property freely and developed a love for nature um, at Textile Research. Um, I was aware of the time when the um, contamination happened because I had moved back home with my parents for a short time period. And it was a very contentious time. It was very upsetting. And it was very interesting information to hear tonight um, about this, the, the magnitude of uh, what the owner is saying um, of the contamination. I think, you know, I still live in Princeton. I, I've moved across town. I live near Markham Park. And I will say there's a really important historical perspective on this, even beyond when my parents bought the property in the 1950s. And that goes back to the original mansion at the textile research. That's one of the original properties in that area before it was chopped up into pieces of land that my parents eventually bought. And I think to consider that is, is critically important as well as the natural landscape that surrounds that property. And 
there is such an enormous opportunity here for the town to take and make a really good decision together collaboratively to um, absolutely that piece of land, um, the Heights, the um, Morgan Height and Constance Heights, who's one of the founders of, of Holder Center, they, they were the original owners over there. And um, they had a beautiful, beautiful uh, view of the lake. And to, to think that in their legacy, that there could be an opportunity for this town to really make a good decision um, uh, for future generations to develop um, appreciation of nature as well as um, history um, would be wonderful. So what I would hope, and I'm so grateful that um, Ms. Sachs, that you, Councilwoman Sachs, that you suggested the importance of making a decision on, on facts. So I, I would really hope that the council um, tonight would, would really think through what are the exact facts here and make that decision. Um, and it sounds like there's some there's some muddy waters in terms of facts. Um, and I would hope that you could hold off on this decision. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Mr. Chow? Yeah, I guess I am concerned uh, on the issue that Mia raised about, it's kind of a due process issue. Like I, I, I wanna support the, the resolution because uh, I, I do see the importance of uh, being able, to, the town being able to impose certain development requirements. Uh, so I, I wanna support it, but I think I am concerned about due process um, that they weren't notified or they didn't see the report and um, hearing that maybe the evidence is not as clear given all what the different perspectives that, that have been uh, put forward about the contamination. Um, and so I, I guess if we table this, what what is the practical things that we can achieve and and meet again on March sixteenth or whenever in in a in sufficient time? Can we get the some more evidence? Uh, can we you know it will um, uh, will the other lawyer who's dedicated for development uh, be able to manage our process and, and clarify everything? Well, um, channeling Mr. Kyle, I want to jump in and say there was no report. <laughs> um, okay. I used that word improperly, but the area in need of rehabilitation uh, um, designation does not require a report. It simply requires, um, you know, looking at conditions and properties uh, or characteristics of the property and seeing whether they meet any of those criteria laid out in the law. So there's no report the same way there is with a um, redevelopment area designation. Okay. Um, and is there a need to notify the owner that, I mean, I, I do, pro, you know, somebody, the town could s suddenly take my property and say, we want to designate it as an area for rehabilitation. Yes, yeah, that separate question yeah. and an excellent yeah, question. That, and I'm, and I'm my understanding about that. is, that there isn't, but I don't know. Mr. Lesko, you had your finger up? Yeah, I mean, you know, not, not to get scary, but the town of Westfield did just that. Did just that. Um, they did it all throughout the municipality. Um, and, and, you know, I wouldn't believe that they notified every single owner because there's no notification requirement. Um, okay. Again, for- but that, but that seems to be something that's in dispute. That's, I'm sorry, I just want to say yeah. there is absolutely no evidence that the owner was or was not notified of anything. And so we should not make our decisions tonight based on what was represented. We There are different differing accounts here, and we're not going to sort it out tonight, but it should not be based on the representation of Mr. McCleary, who is may or may not be speaking truthfully. Um, and we're not going to sort it out tonight. And I think we, you know, it's- Well, he, he is assumed to be under oath. I'm sorry to interrupt. Assumed to be under oath, as I understand it, because he's an attorney. Um, and, and that's really, you know, was what underlay why I invited him to speak a second time. Um, but but I'm not, I'm not just- I just, I'm sorry to jump in and disagree. I don't but. know. I think there's so much we don't know about 
the the upper the communications between these two private companies and we are not going to be able to figure it out in the context of a rehab designation hearing and whatever happened between the two companies i'm sure will be sorted out and i think at this point we either have the option to table this or to justin's point there could be a recommendation that the planning board um supports the council in wanting to represent the community and the neighbors' interests in maintaining what was described in the uh, the master plan as a recreational um, and access, lakefront access, um, you know, all of those things, um, and that the the planning board would not advise the council to move forward in, in any respect until we're able to ascertain, um, you know. The veracity of of the various accounts or what whatever it is that we need to ascertain before moving forward and i think either of those would be acceptable paths okay thank you for that um alvin and david are waiting justin did you have something to say quickly before yeah, yeah i just well i i wanted to address phil's comment um that i was getting to uh, about what it would change between next week um or, or going to the next meeting. And I think, you know, what, what Mr. Kyle laid out before and, and what I said about the master plan, those facts don't change um, based on anything else we heard tonight about a Green Acres easement, um, uh, you know, uh, about anything else. So I think the criteria, uh, which is what you're commenting on, is going to stay the same. Um, the master plan obviously is staying the same. Um, so, you know, to that end, if we do wait till the 16th, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily speak for Jim, but I think him and I are going to say the same things. Uh, thanks. Uh, Alvin McGowan and then David Cohen. Um, this discussion has gotten very, has gotten very confusing from what at least I thought we were trying to do here. Now, quite frankly, I felt that Council wants to do this. Somehow council, this is an option that council wants, wants to have to develop whatever is going to be there or not develop. And there's no, there's no proposal, there's nothing to consider, and I can't consider what may or may not be there. there it was good to hear some outline of some possibilities that'll be there, but 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 that's all that's all there is. So um this to me seems a lot simpler than 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 what is what what we're arguing about. I don't I don't know anything about these other parties, um, you know, if they have a, an agreement or disagreement. I I don't know. And if I'm gonna have to make that decision, then they're gonna have to figure out they have to come back. But I don't think that's particularly relevant to to what we to what we have to do here. This uh, I and and I I also assume that even that even going through this, there's still a redevelopment process, if I'm not mistaken, that's going to follow at some point. And in, and in, even in that, when you make recommendations as to what to do, there's still those these arguments still can be taken up uh, at 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 this point. So, you know, I, I don't see why we can't move forward. And and if you will, it seems like we're starting to get a little far afield of what we what we're trying to do here. Thanks, Alvin. Um, David? Yeah, so I think that um, to Justin's point, from a procedural standpoint, I don't think we're going to have more information. I don't want to spend another hour discussing this on the 16th. Um, I think that there's a very reasonable recommendation that this board can make to council tonight, which is that, you know, we're in favor of uh, having the benefits of the area in need of rehabilitation designation, um, but that there are questions that were raised at the hearing about the Green Acres, even to Tim Quinn's point, uh, questions about 
the underutilization of the property, you know, is that really a, an appropriate criteria um, to be basing this designation on? Um, what is the extent of the contamination is a, is a question that some of the uh, members of the public had. So I think that, you know, we can ask Justin to write a report that summarizes some of the concerns that we had as a board. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to say that we find it qualifies. We can just say that we have concerns about it, but I think we should finish with, with it tonight rather than tabling it um, for the very reason that Justin said, is that if we wait, we may not have a chance to weigh in at all. And I think there's been some productive discussion, productive information generated tonight that we can pass on to council um, to help with, with their moving forward or not. Uh, thanks, Mr. Cohen. Mr. O'Donnell? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am, I think like Alvin, very confused and uh, like Mr. Uh, Chow, very torn because I do have an issue with the town not notifying the property owner that this was going on, if that indeed did happen. Uh, you know, I just find that a very odd uh, circumstance to go forward. Um, and, but like Mr. McGowan, I think that the, the question before us is much narrower uh, <clears throat> than all of this. And there are, you know, there's more process to be done uh, depending on, on what the recommendation is. And just finally, it, makes me very uncomfortable that it seems that some members of the board have more information than other members of the board. I mean, I know from, you know, what I've read in the packet and what I've heard tonight, and I don't believe there was anything in there about a contract purchaser or, you know, any behind the scenes, you know, negotiations that are going on among uh, parties who were not mentioned here now. So that makes me very uncomfortable. Well, and members of council are privy to that. I, I that understand that, but we're supposed to make actually decisions a public, based on it was a matter what, of public. It was a matter of public record. It was mentioned in the presentation at council. I'm sorry, I'm sorry it didn't make it into the packet that you got, Owen, but it's not, it hasn't been concealed. Yeah. I, I, and I'm not saying it was concealed, but I'm just saying that, you know, it's not something that I was privy to or aware of. But Owen, as council members, we wear two caps. I and understand. I understand. My yeah. council members, either the, there's a mayor's designee and a, a council representative to the board. And we obviously on a daily basis have access to more information. And that's why we are specifically assigned to have a seat on the council. And, um, and you know, obviously now we're really going far afield, but it just, there was an implication but, but that, you, that I think- but, but yeah. So, but you can't but you can't expect us as members to, to to react to something that you know in in the detail and with the amount of knowledge that you have when we don't have it somehow that has to be more somehow it has to be more explanation and that and I think I think that was part of the point that Mr. O'Donnell is making you know you you do have and and that's fine you've got yeah. superior knowledge but I don't you know, um, and and particularly when I'm when, you know, when again, it, it what I get, what's in the packet. That's that's really kind of kind of what I, what I know. So that's what gets disturbing from the point of view of a planning board member. And I think okay. you know it goes to the point that this sort of a hearing is supposed to be very simple and not actually take a lot of comment and that's why my my point was when you start having attorneys uh showing up and making uh you know adding all sorts of information it's the original purpose has already been eroded um and i think it's you know uh an exercise for the planning board to figure out how we can main, con maintain control of our hearings because obviously that has not been the case tonight so um that will be a task that we can work on but uh, I, I guess we're left with what was the original question and whether, 
I, I actually think statutorily that it's it's this doesn't even require a vote. It's just uh, you know whether the planning board wants to make recommendations. So I think the recommendations that could be made here are pretty obvious, as David and and Tim alluded to. Yeah, Dave. Well, I want to hear from you, Tim, and then um, based on my notes, maybe reiterate what I took to be David's invitation for a, um, a motion. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I was just going to sort of attempt to summarize our options here. Uh, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I see three, which is to have a vote on the resolution as it was received. Uh, the second option would be the one uh, Councilwoman Sachs uh, urged the board to table. And the third one was uh, Councilman Sachs, uh, oh, sorry, pardon me, Councilman Cohen's um, idea that we asked Justin to summarize our concerns and discussions in a memo uh, to council and take no action on the resolution. And I would ask, uh, I would ask my friend Councilman Cohen to uh, tell me if I've accurately summarized his suggestion. Yes. And based on my notes, that that motion would be in uh, that or the directive instruction to Justin would be that the board is in favor of the benefits that an area in need of rehabilitation confers, that questions have been raised that uh, regarding underutilization and extent of contamination and green acres uh, status and encumbrance that need to be um, addressed. And um, yeah, that is, but it, it, I, I guess on balance would be viewed as a, um, an endorsement of the concept and an acceptance, um, but with, well, an, an acceptance with the understanding that there needs to be a, a clearer understanding of the, the exactly how the criteria apply, the extent of the contamination and the um, question of underutilization. Uh, Mr. Taylor? Yeah, this has been a, a fascinating discussion to be, to be neutral. Whatever we decide to do tonight, I think each of us individually and collectively, the planning board will find this to be an uncomfortable process. Notwithstanding that, it would seem to me that the simple resolution of our dilemma would be to approach the decision as a yes or a no. Has the criteria been met? It would appear in my judgment to have been met as originally presented. But then the most important part of our resolution becomes the expression of our concerns or the issues. And that can be done in a lawyer-like way without appearing to be editorial other than in the choice of the concerns that we express. Okay, so... Um... That's option so that, one, as I outlined. That's a, yeah, yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's different than what, as I understand it, and I don't want to be putting words in people's mouth, that's different than what Mr. Cohen was inviting. Um, so we, you know, we don't have, we don't have a motion <laughs> um, to consider, um, but, but what I've heard is the suggestion of two, you know, quite different ones with Mr. Cohen's being that we, support the that we're that we're generally in favor of the benefits that 
that this designation would confer to the town for the good of the town and that there are questions that have been raised that need to be addressed um, by council uh, that that we recommend be addressed by council before an area in need of rehabilitation designation be um, adopted. Is that correct, Mr. Cohen? Am I? Yeah, and I to I really want to emphasize. I think that if this board has any legal jeopardy, as Mia has expressed concern about. You know, it would be to ignore the questions, the legitimate questions that have come up about both criteria, right? Is this site underutilized? It's a subjective um, decision that there's some legitimate disagreement about as, as I heard the discussion. And I think in terms of the contamination as well, and we did hear from the property owner, you know, it's it sounds like it's contained, it's being handled. Uh, it's They're claiming that it's not uh, something that's uh, inhibiting the development of the property. I accept Mia's point that, you know, they weren't under oath and I, I don't wanna make a judgment one way or the other, but what I do wanna say is that there, we have heard legitimate questions about both of the criteria. And so to do what Jack is suggesting, I think is something that does open us to um, concerns, which is why I prefer what I had and what I think Justin was um, also recommending. Okay, thanks, David. Mr. Quinn? Yeah, just to, uh, for the benefit of, of Mr. Taylor, I'm I'll say that I'm not totally comfortable voting on the resolution as it is um, because of questions about the criteria. And I would endorse a, I endorse uh, Councilman Cohen's more, pardon the biblical uh, reference, Solomonic <laughs> approach to, um, to, the, to the matter at hand that allows the boards that allows the board's concerns to be heard while endorsing the concept of of the um, area in need of rehabilitation. Provided there is clarity uh, on those two on, on those, those issues. two criteria. And the Green Acres question. Yeah, correct. Mr. McGowan. Um. If someone could give me some more clarification, I have now heard more than once that the board could be at some jeopardy, some type of legal jeopardy. Can someone please be a little, maybe Mr. Mueller can be a little yeah, more. Yeah, I think we need to hear from you know, Mr. Mueller about Great. that. Thanks, Alvin. I don't think there is more jeopardy, frankly, uh, than you would find in any development application uh, review. I mean, if the board decides that um, the criteria have been satisfied, uh, sure, they, that, that can be challenged. Uh, but because the functionality of, of that is so limited, I, I think that uh, that a court would give a lot of leeway to the board. And I, I don't see the board being vulnerable. And uh, I don't see the board being vulnerable on the way the hearing was processed. I don't think it was out of control at all, to tell you the truth. Um, and I think uh, we would have been foolish if we had not let um, members of the public and uh, the attorney for um, the TRI and its president speak. Okay, um, are there other questions or would someone like to make a motion that's been described? I, I would invite I would invite Councilman Cohen to. <laughs> <laughs> to make such a motion since I second made. I second the nomination. <laughs> yeah, you got us into it. It's now so yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Although I I I think uh the chair summarized yeah. what I was trying to say very nicely. So I'll just reiterate uh without going into every single um point. 
that my motion would be to ask our planner to write a memo to council identifying concerns that we heard from members of the public and that were voiced by members of the board about whether this truly met the criteria for the designation but that i mean we're in we support the designation for the benefits that it would uh, yield to the town uh, in the planning process, but that we um, have these concerns that we'd like the council to um, resolve before moving forward. I would second that motion. We have a motion for Mr. Cohen, a second for Mr. Quinn. Um, Carrie, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Chow? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. McGowan? Can I just think for a minute? Can you come back to me? Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Quinn? Yes. Sax? Abstain. Tex Arnie? Yeah. Sorry, Justin. Giving you more work. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Wilson? Yes. And Mr. McGowan, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, thanks, everybody. I That was a, a longer and more arduous um, discussion than I think anybody anticipated. But I do think that um, important things were raised, not only by board members, but by um, those uh, attending and speaking to us. And um, I really appreciate your uh, forbearance and hanging in there to try to understand as much as possible. Um, and uh, I don't think there's anything else on the agenda. So I'm going to turn to Mr. Cohen. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Texarni has his hand up. Oh, I don't know if uh, it's right time to say it because I, I don't know if discussion about this has ended, but I, I do feel like uh, it would be in, a good if the town looked at, you know, making the whole entire town as a area of uh, rehabilitation, need of rehabilitation, I think it would just make things a lot easier. I think that, you know, this case it was gray, gray and, I, you know, I guess the council will have to also ultimately decide, um, you know, what what it is. But um, I think that the town could probably meet the criteria of, uh, you know, the housing stock uh, and just make make this process a lot easier. So anyways, easier, you say <laughs> everyone gets a five year tax abatement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. It's it's only uh, 920 and I feel punchy. Don't okay. put that in. Don't put that no. in. The memo, Justin, <laughs> <laughs> please do not put that in the memo. I was not advocating for that. It's just a, a one possible consequence of of that. That one possible legal question that would have to be answered before council sought to. I think the I think meeting that criteria would probably be easier than this one. But anyways, I don't want it's, to keep uh, this It's interesting. Longer. It's an it interesting is. question, and and municipalities have done that. Yeah. Um, so it's not. Yeah. We would not be uh, inventing the wheel, reinventing yeah, and, the wheel. And, and okay. To, to, to Tim's kind of uh, joke there about the tax abatement, one of the towns did that for an area. I don't know how that's legal, but they did it. Yeah, I, I don't see how it conceivably is, is legal, unless it's a very, very small town. I mean, to I mean, give everyone a tax abatement? Not everyone, but a certain area that they chose. I, I, okay, we're, we're going so far afield. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Second. Second. Thank you. Thank you for putting us out of our misery. Um, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. See you in two weeks. All right, everybody. Want to have a vote on that motion? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Good night. Thanks. Good night, everybody.